two, one. We are recording and welcome uh, to e e Evaluative Clinical Science Rounds here. And we begin with Rettelmeyer's uh, points of, uh, of etiquette. Number one, mute your microphone and kill your video feeds. It just sometimes overwhelms the system otherwise. Number two is use the group chat function to raise questions. You don't have to type out all of your questions. I just mentioned I have a question, and then, and then I will then invite you to unmute your microphone. Number three is please be gentle on our presenter. It is so hard to be funny to tell a joke on Zoom. When in doubt, you know, uh, uh, just give him some positive snaps on, on the commentary. But number four is please forgive me when I mangle your name. Again, it's very hard to, uh, to, uh, to pronounce all the names properly on the on the chat function and fifth is you know realize that zoom is always a, a technical gamble maybe we make it to 1 p.m successfully maybe we don't we just don't know there's an infinite probability of of technical glitches end of my five, my five points of etiquette now our presenter today is dr peter juni who received his diploma in medicine from the University of Bern in 1995, followed by internship and residency training in a combination of social and, prevental me and preventive medicine uh, combined with internal medicine, all ending in Bern around 1999, followed by a first fellowship in health services research from uh, Bristol, a second fellowship uh, I, 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 I'm involving some rheumatology uh, back in Bern in 2002, uh, and, and then a third fellowship as a senior research fellow inside the Institute for Social and Preventative Medicine, all ending around uh, 2006. Uh, Peter is currently a full professor at the University of Toronto, the director of the Applied Health Services Research Center at St. Michael's Hospital, as well as a um, former medical practitioner in, in Switzerland. Lots and lots of, of accomplishments too. I was impressed by over 300 Medline articles to his name. He's got an H index of 83. He is an active investigator on multiple funded grants. Plus he is just such everlasting Euro chic. So good, he's got an umlaut in his last name. Thanks very much for being with us here today, uh, Peter. Yeah, the umlaut is a curse in North America. <clears throat> I even got uh, uh, in situations where I didn't have a social insurance number because of it and I didn't uh, get my salary paid. So uh, never never go for an umlaut if you can avoid it. Uh, both a blessing and a curse. <laughs> okay, so um, thanks for the invite. Um, this paper actually goes back and I just tried to get rid of uh, the Zoom thingy here it's always a, a bit of a challenge good uh, it goes back to uh, a talk i gave to a lay audience on march the 5th um, so when the world was still sort of in order and i remember very distinctly when i when i gave this talk first uh, two days before um, to my staff and i uh, told them that what will be coming is unprecedented after the talk i just felt like did I overstate things a little bit? And obviously not. So on the 5th of March, I gave this talk to a lay audience. And um, when I did that, I was also talking about seasonality. You know, the uh, usual stuff that you're uh, aware of, uh, seasonality of influenza here, um, basically a, an image from, uh, from Wikipedia among uh, you know, on their deaths in uh, 122 US cities here, you know, 210 to 214, look at the calendar weeks. And uh, I discussed potential explanations of seasonality, made the point that even for influenza, it's not entirely clear. Humidity, temperature, immune status, perhaps closed spaces that we are uh, more uh, likely to be in and be close to each other uh, in the winter. And um, was then just pointing out that there were some aspects, um, those in red, <clears throat> that irrespective of the virus actually could play a role, whether it's a coronavirus, an influenza virus, or something else. 
And then um, at the end of the talk, um, a man in the audience actually asked an innocent question, which was, but why is it that if there would be seasonality for, uh, for COVID-19, for SARS-CoV-2, that Singapore is struggling to? And I said, yeah, you're right. I mean, there may be a way to look at it. And it really, I, I left and it really, this question really bucked me. It really bucked me. <clears throat> and uh, this was on the 5th, on the 5th of March, on the 6th of March, the penny dropped. Basically, what I then said is, wait a moment, we're near um, the vernal equinox and uh, we're having this pandemic that is actually really a pandemic. It's really global. That's Singapore down there. As uh, you heard just before, I'm from here, from Switzerland. Singapore is just at the equator. And uh, here we are now in, uh, in Toronto. If you look at that, especially if you're, if you're near the Avernal Equinox, what you know is that um, solar radiation, temperature, and also absolute humidity must be directly a function of latitude. So they should be associated with the square of the latitude. Why with the square? Because at the vernal equinox or close to vernal equinox, um, the, uh, this all would run through the equator, no transformation necessary, nothing to be done. You could just use the latitude of these three places and associate it with uh, measures of the pandemic, what measure of the pandemic will, be, will then be the issue, and you might actually get something out of it. Now, one of the things, you know, I felt, okay, I would have figured it out. This was on Friday, just that I think it was the day after I gave this talk, but something else bugged me at that time, and uh, it's, it, it continues to bug everybody until now, you know, which is, you never quite know what people are doing. Um, you never quite know how much they're testing. Now we know better, but, but imagine this was uh, on the 6th of March, 6th, 7th of March. I didn't have the slightest clue and there were no data available at that time, etc., etc. So if you just measure the height of the iceberg here, um, you don't have a clue what's underneath and the height of the iceberg will just um, depend on the possibilities but also on the attitudes of the geopolitical areas we would study of the countries or US states or Canadian provinces, et cetera, et cetera. And then the penny dropped uh, next morning on Saturday and I said, yeah, that's true. Um, I may not know how much is below here, but what I will know is something about the shape of the iceberg. I cannot measure the height, but I'm able to measure the shape, meaning I focus on the slope of the thing or on one measure on the, of, of the slope, but I do not focus on absolute numbers of cases, absolute numbers of deaths, whatever it is. If you want to make this, if I want to make this comparable between geopolitical areas. You know? So one would not necessarily, if you uh, just look at this, uh, you know, globally, uh, just uh, just for once, which of course is full of uh, of uh, uh, the ecological fallacy. But if you look at that, it's still impressive how uh, how closely it behaves, you know, just to a regular um, epidemiological model. I would not go for the absolute height of this bell-shaped curve, but I could look at the slope here. This shape should remain reasonably constant irrespective of testing strategies. And what I then said, and this there was really still very much when I wrote the first um, draft of the protocol, I was very much on my own. I just said, I'll pre-specify what I think. And before I haven't pre-specified anything, I will not look at anything, no data, etc. The point was then that it's probably much easier. There's a lot less variance um, if I don't focus on the slope of the wave, but I focus on the slope of the cumulative frequency curve, this slope here. You know? This was the idea. And that's how I ended up then with writing on Saturday, 
a protocol version 1.0 for the thing that I was about to analyze. So perhaps I stop here asking, you know, whether there are any questions or comments on the thinking up to there. I see that there's already a question from um, a, a, a Don Rettelmeyer. Go ahead and um, uh, mute your microphone. Okay, fine. Um, when, when you're modeling that curve, are you using a, a Gompertz functional form or, or, a, uh, or another a sigmoidal model? No, here this is just a, that's basically just a, a, a classical model. It's also not about the curve per se. I, I, I need to clarify that. Let's perhaps go on. It's a, it, let's not get sidetracked here about you know the type of uh, of epidemiological model used. We did not model anything. We just observed. So this is just to give you a hunch what kind of curve we would look at. But you will see in a moment that we actually go much simpler even. So okay, um, that's very helpful. So you're not actually forcing in a, a, a parametric no. model here. No, nothing at all. So, so um, I actually I, I, I just before we go on, there's a, a, a question from Mackenzie Hamilton. We we'll go ahead and unmute. Hi there. Yes. Um, so my question is, did you account for any variability in individual locations? So yes we can evaluate the slope between places, but um, changes in testing behaviors in a single place could have dramatic impacts on um, single location slopes too. Let's see where the talk goes. I'll talk about all of that. Okay, I tell you, you this thing is full of problems and full of challenges and uh, you'll see how we try to resolve it and how we intend to resolve them in the future. We can talk about that at the very end. Okay, I hope by then you. I will have addressed your question. Okay. So here I was having written a first, um, a, a first protocol that actually also tried to address as many covariates I could find, but we will see what kind of covariates. At that time, there were absolutely no data available on testing, nothing whatsoever. And we are still, we're still at the 7th of March, uh, approaching the morning of the 8th when I, for the first time, actually downloaded the data. And um, when we downloaded the data and when I looked into that, you see basically that's the flow. We ended up with 73 geopolitical areas, four states in Australia, two provinces in Canada, uh, 58 uh, other countries that had uh, at the time point of the observation at the accumulated at least um, 10 cases and no other requirement at that point. And that's the data um, I originally analyzed. Just keep that in mind. Very small, just 5,500 cases. What we excluded was China. Why? China had it under control. And uh, what we excluded was um, South Korea. They started to have it under control. Italy and Iran, because these two were considered to be already in the middle of the epidemic with pot the potential to reach a hyperendemic state um, during our measurements that we would do. Therefore, we excluded those, but we focused on the rest of the world, what was available at that time. And look how beautiful it looked at the time. No? Just as predicted, the quadratic, uh, the quadratic term just uh, plays out as you would wish for. It really runs through latitude. You see, the, when you're just close to the equator, actually, the epidemic growth is less. I'll talk about the metric later then. Remember what we do? I can just tell you already, a two means that the number of cases doubles in a week. A four means that the number of cases quadruples in a week. Overall number of cases cumulated, meaning I, I measure at the time point and I measure a week later. And between this time point, what has accumulated by then and a week later, the overall number has doubled. So think about that. You know, what is weird with this curve here? That's the big deal. What was weird is that we had all these outliers up here, you know, that could well actually have resulted in completely overestimating this thing. But there were also other things that I just wasn't quite sure. So we said, okay, this was, I, I, I still, I nearly fell off the chair when I saw this, you know, I basically programmed it first, everything on Sunday and around noon or so when everything was ready and I pressed the button, I really didn't inspect it. It was just like, boom, 
what the heck, is there really a relationship? Is this really true? And then we started the game according to the protocol because at that time, the only thing I had was latitude, nothing else. But I had a protocol that pre-space specified quite a lot of things that we would measure. And obviously, um, the most important thing that we would measure, and now which took us from then to really just having more definite results, you know, during just uh, this first round, it took us about two weeks. We would measure things like uh, GDP, uh, you know, a percentage of, of a GDP invested for healthcare. Um, we would look at the distance from the nearest epidemic hotspot. We would look at, um, you know, uh, vulnerability scores for infectious diseases, et cetera, et cetera. You name it, we would try to get the data for. And obviously, we would also look at the uh, two pre-specified covariates of interest in addition that are coming from the, you know, the causal pathway. Latitude doesn't have a problem. Nothing causes latitude. We all obey to latitude when we go to a place and actually uh, you know, just, uh, just erect the city uh, some 1,000 years ago or so. Um, so what comes next? What is mediating? If this would really just be on the, on the uh, pathway to transmission, would obviously be absolute humidity and, uh, and temperature. So let's have a look then. That's, we, that's what we did then for the 79 areas. I didn't have a clue at that time where I could get the data. So there was, I can tell you, there was a lot of manual work done by, my, by, by Pavlos, my postdoc. So what we found for these uh, 73 areas, it was, I think, again, this absolutely gorgeous relationship. Look at it here. This is just all too good to be true, isn't it? And here, that's the absolute humidity. Again, it looks wonderful. Why absolute and not relative humidity? Absolute humidity is directly associated, again, with, uh, with temperature and, and um, latitude. Um, because uh, it's, it's really just measuring the absolute content of water in a cubic meter of, uh, of, uh, of air. Whereas relative humidity is depending on the temperature, is associated with altitude, etc., etc. Therefore, it wasn't the primary point of interest. But we'll also talk about relative humidity later. No? So I had all these data and I had a lot more data. We had about 10 covariates, you know, very carefully sorted out for all the US states that already had contributed, etc., etc. You cannot imagine how much work this is and how much I learned. Uh, and uh, how much Pavlos, my postdoc, learned, you know, within the two weeks. We, we essentially just worked day and night for this thing. And whatever we did with the data, it stayed completely robust. We could explain a lot of the variants, you know, about 40 to 50 percent with latitude mainly, but also a temperature and absolute humidity linearly here, of course, not the quadratic term, explained a lot of the variants. So here we were, and then all of a sudden, my seven-year-old daughter kicked in, luckily, and told me, okay, can we go for a walk? At that time, you know, restaurants were still open. It was a beautiful day. You know, I had worked for two weeks on this thing. It was kind of crazy. I think it was two weeks. We will see the dates then later, or the dates are even here, March 14th. March 14th, things were ready, okay? It's actually only one week, but it felt like two because we worked day and night uh, on this thing. So we went out and I just walked with her and we chit-chatted a bit and I just let go. And we went to this little place here, sat on this sofa and then enjoyed my ginger latte. And then the penny dropped. This was just all too good to be true. This would not be me this time. You know, this was already panic mode in science at that time. All the preprints, etc. I would not contribute to the garbage here. Either this would be real, and we just try to get it really right. You know, everything we 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 just uh, we just do that properly, and we really try to falsify this uh, this association if it's not there. So be it, but we just do it right. We just benefit from the situation we're in and we just move on. And I started to talk to my colleagues and told them, guys, we should not go out with this. We just get it right now. So 
we worked on it and we basically developed protocol version 1.1 and then uh, protocol version 1.2. And it is 1.2 then eventually that got published on May the 8th. So considerably later, you know, before we were just on March the 14th. So we can imagine there were quite a lot of issues <laughs> that happened in between until we got this thing published just shortly before the discussion came up, you know, whether Montreal now would open the schools or not, etc. This was why we also tried, you know, to get this in, to get this out. And I also, at that time, I also just said clearly, guys, I know everybody does preprints. I will not do any of that. I'm sorry. I will want this peer reviewed. I only go out when this is ready, not before we don't contribute to the panic mode here, which is don't. So what we ended up with is, um, as I show you then with the, uh, with the study design, because we continue to measure at the same time point as before, but we then waited for two weeks until we, we, uh, we then went for, uh, for the follow-up, as you'll see in a moment. We ended up with 144 geopolitical areas, 375,000 cases, rather than the 5,600 or so that you have. And they're still the same criteria as before, what we excluded. Only that we were more stringent, you know, with the number of cases, local transmission had to be documented before we included the region, et cetera, et cetera. And you see what we ended up with, six provinces in Canada, five states in Australia, 43 states in the US, and 90 other countries. Here is the final um, layout of the design. So what you see here is still the original exposure period then that we just here, I met, here I looked at the data for the first time. That's what we did. And there I did it on a cross-sectional way because I just measured latitude. Latitude obviously doesn't change. Remember vernal equinox this year was on the 19th of March. I didn't say that before, but we were sufficiently close anyway. But what we then said is, you know, just uh, when revising the protocol, it was all pre-specified. We did not look at the data after the initial look here that we did, okay, we wait for 14 days. Why 14 days? 14 days is the average, internationally speaking, I can't prove it, but it's probably quite close to, to the truth, between um, when the transmission happens and a case gets reported. No, that's the, that's the notion here. This is uh, basically the incubation period, and then people get slowly, perhaps, um, or not, you know, slowly um, symptomatic, and then they wait a few days until it gets worse, and then they get to go to their uh, physician, and then it needs to make it into the statistics. And if it really goes fast, it takes perhaps nine to 10 days. If it goes uh, average, we're at our 14 days, and it could take as long as perhaps 18, 19 days. So 14 days for us was the sweet spot. And we pre-specified that we didn't fish for anything. So exposure period, very classical epidemiology. This is not infectious disease epidemiology, very classical. And then wait a moment and then do the follow-up. And the, as I said before, the follow-up uh, was then just referring the cumulative number, emphasis on cumulative number of cases at the end of the follow-up period, X2, and divide this by the cumulative number of cases a week before. I can't remember what weekdays this were. So X2 divided by X1, that's the rate ratio, and it's obviously the log rate ratio that you analyze in your regression model. This was the outcome you know, that we took. To, uh, to look into that, comparing March 27th cumulative case count with March 20th, the thing is Poisson distributed and uh, obviously uh, the standard error will be, uh, will be composed of, of uh, the square root of one divided by the cumulative count on March 20 plus one divided by the difference between these two, something like this, no? Actually, Peter, just before you go on, I think Andrew Gershon has a question. Hi, I'm, I'm sorry, because it's, it's kind of the, the previous slide, but I just wondering, um, and maybe you're probably going to get to it, but did you think about asymptomatic transmission and did, did that figure into this in any place at this point? No, it would not. It, it, it's not a problem at all. It's just a transmission, no? And what you then have, so first of all, remember the iceberg. What you have is all the individual situations in the individual countries, et cetera, and there was no way, we didn't model anything. We just observed what ended up in the statistics, nothing else. So 
So the, at that time point, the asymptomatic transmissions were probably still quite equally distributed between countries at the time point of, uh, or the month of March. You didn't have many efforts to start to, uh, to, uh, to test asymptomatic people. It was just more an extent of how many you tested and how you basically reported uh, for those who were symptomatic. But again, there was no way to account for it. The only thing I could tell is that whether it's asymptomatic transmission or symptomatic transmission and uh, whether people stay uh, asymptomatic or become symptomatic, etc., the behavior is similar just at different levels, if I look at the at the slopes of the curves, remember it's the it's the slope of the of the cumulative mm -hmm. frequency curve that we look at. That was the assumption. The behavior is sort of similar across geopolitical areas, but we need to discuss quite a few of these things then later on. You'll see then some of the results also. Okay, thank you. So here is the. Uh, a set of characteristics that you see just uh, with uh, the median and the interquartile range don't fall into the trap like one of the of the peer reviewers uh, at the beginning who said oh the temperature it's just a range of 7.3 to 21.2 this is interquartile range so the real temperature range was from minus 10 to plus 31 degrees something this was uh, somewhere in uh, in africa ugudugu if i remember correctly no um, you see how the relative humidity behaves with the interquartile range, the, uh, the absolute humidity. So there was a big range, you know, if you look at that. We looked at altitude, obviously, passenger flights. We didn't have a, a possibility at that time to, uh, to have any measures of the passenger flights just happening during the exposure period. So this was in the previous year. We didn't have anything that's just as good as, as, good as it got, uh, got at that time. You look at the urban density that we looked at. So the most dense urban area in the geopolitical area, a state or a country. And uh, we also looked at the, uh, the, the population. You see it here, the median was at 7.1, but you see really the most of the, of the geopolitical areas were reasonably small, okay. I mean, there's an exception, for instance, Brazil. We were not able to, at that time, to uh, just look at different Brazilian states. So we took Brazil as it is, as a bulk. Percentage of inhabitants older than 65 or equal, life expectancy, etc. You see what goes on. And what is striking here is any public health intervention during the exposure period, March 7th to 13th, in roughly a quarter. So uh, one of my uh, colleagues, uh, Ori Rothstein, said most were still asleep on the steering wheel at that time point. No? A quarter of, uh, of uh, the, the countries and states had implemented something during the exposure period. No? Social distancing only 6.9%, 10. What means social distancing? That uh, it was any intervention that aimed at preventing smaller clusters of five to 10 people or so. Whereas the mass gatherings, the lowest, the lowest cutoff um, that we were aware of was 50, the highest 5,000. We put everything into one basket at that time point, okay? And school closures is clear. School closures, that's important, for instance, for Ontario, also included school holidays. So imagine how much fun this was. We tried to figure out um, school holidays reliably in 144 areas in the world. It's just sleepless nights, basically. And here is then a, a breakdown according to public health interventions. Last part here is how it distributed, you know, in the world. Remember? China, South Korea, Iran, and Italy were excluded. That's where we, what we had basically at the time for uh, Asia, Oceania, Europe, Africa, America. And Actually, the closest Peter, is just before you go on, but there's another yeah. question from Andrea, and then uh, maybe another one from me too. But Andrea, you're first. Hi, sorry, I, I just find this really interesting because they talk about uh, the school holidays, like when people came back from the school holidays and it different times in different places, were you able to consider that as well? Like that, those periods of time when all families go traveling somewhere else and then they all come back and they bring it with them. Yeah, so no, we didn't look into that part, but uh, I'll then tell you what our current plans are, what we're looking into right now. So the, the point was, you know, what we, for instance here, you know, what, what you see here is um, even though Ontario still had the schools open at the time of our uh, exposure period, Ontario would immediately after the exposure period close schools. Why? Because they were lucky um, that the school holidays, spring break yeah, just kicked yeah. in. 
Whereas Quebec was earlier and the phenomenon that you're referring to was exactly happening. You know, yeah. they still went away and came back and then they just moved all of what they, what they brought back into the schools, most likely. I cannot prove that. But what I'm sure is that, that Quebec was unlucky. They closed schools because of holidays and then they reopened and then they only closed because of the pandemic. So Ontario, that we were a bit luckier than Quebec, that is yeah. purely coincidental. It was not that our uh, government was so particularly cool. They just benefited from the, from the school holidays as well, you know, at that time. And then they left school luckily closed and that's lucky, luckily for all of us. We need to talk about the independent effect. Can I prove that school closures are responsible? We will, we will talk about that later. Um, Don, uh, do you also have a question still? Yeah, a small question about, uh, uh, not so much about inference, but about data collection. How in the world did you get all these covariates from 140 separate jurisdictions like air flights, like cl school closure? I tell you, it was an adventure in itself. So some of the stuff, you know, if you're at country level, is easy. Like you have some... some um, um, uh, covariates from the World Bank for entire countries, but you don't have it for US states and provinces. But then you start to realize the World Bank is unreliable sometimes. Then we you know we looked into flights. We start we we, we used the uh, CIA's um, um, World Factbook until we found out the CIA's World Factbook is a disaster if it if you look at the number of flights. So we basically extracted wherever we could from uh, three or four sources, you know, of, uh, of uh, international associations that actually collected this. But sometimes we had to go back and, and uh, you know, go to the websites of the airports, try to figure this or that out. We did, you can't imagine, there, were, there was stuff in there. We have, um, what was it? We, we, for instance, also were um, looking into um, the number of hospital beds it's not in here because we never could get the number of icu beds we better now we now might be able also to incorporate number of icu beds so we didn't use it here and it wasn't it was never pre-specified in the protocol um so it's not in the paper because it wasn't pre-specified in the protocol but we tried to find these data and sometimes we went through when it was an island you know an island somewhere, an, 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 an overseas territory. We literally went through every single hospital on the web to find out how many beds they had. So it, it was otherworldly. But you can't imagine. You must be crazy to do that. And, and we managed eventually. I was back into my role as research assistant together with my, with, uh, my postdoc. And uh, there was one statistician who had done her uh, PhD in statistics with me, who was crazy enough to then go down the road of, you know, managing all these data, all the query management, and we sort of made it. But it was otherworldly. I'm impressed. I can smell the sweat from here. Now, there's also another question from uh, Paul Karen Nicholas. Oh, thanks, Don. Hi, Peter. Beautiful work. Um, I may have missed this. Did you incorporate case testing rate in all of this yet, or is that something still to come? And, and similar, so sort of associated with that actual fatality rate as a, as a variable. Uh, I'll talk about that in the outlook. We're much further now. That's part of the second paper. I can tell you my, my, about the journey about testing later on. At that time point, absolutely no testing data available. And we still nowadays, we reverse engineered Spain, for instance. I tell you, we had to use activist data. We had to do make interpolations and extrapolations and now have reasonable data for Spain. Wasn't available before we did the work. So it's really, really challenging. Now we have it. This was also one of the reasons that we went for the outcome we did. We only had, if I go back a few slides, look at that quickly. I, we only had a difference of seven days. And the point was at that time point, and this was just an assumption, and we, we tried to use uh, surrogate um, markers for, uh, for testing pot the potential of testing capacity, which was imperfect. But what we were relatively confident is that during these seven days, the testing approach of the individual geopolitical area would not change that dramatically. But it's a clear weakness at that time point, no possibility, and we discussed that very transparently in the paper, of uh, getting testing data as we have them now. So 
you'll see it then what happens. So now I go, I start to go into the results. That's first, that's the temperatures. So basically for this temperature data, we didn't have a clue that there were two at that time point, that there were two um, R suites available that actually uh, just the use available data, real-time data, near real-time data that we could have used. Just the doing, you know, program this. So my, uh, my postdoc basically collected the data for the exposure period for the capital of the geopolitical area <laughs> manually and we parsed it then after that. So it was, even, even if you look at that, it's uh, quite remarkable, but the point here is not that. The point is the temperature, you know, uh, is actually really nicely associated with the square of the latitude that works. Same for absolute humidity. And if you look at relative humidity as uh, hypothesized, there's no clear relationship. This makes a lot of sense, no? Because relative humidity really depends on uh, the, uh, the air's capacity to, uh, to, uh, to, carry, uh, to carry water. That's the cluster analysis with it. It's all pre-specified. We didn't fish anything. Everything is pre-specified, no inspection of the data, nothing. We didn't want to contribute to the mess as I told before. So that's a cluster analysis. You see some of these super clusters that you have, what's happening, altitude and relative humidity. Here you see how they're correlated, no? Passenger flights, weirdly enough, with a life expectancy at birth. No, not weirdly enough, actually, because that's uh, obviously those uh, countries that have a lot of passenger flights also have a really good infrastructure, etc., etc. You see a bit how it goes, but I don't go into detail. We run out of time otherwise. Based on, a, on, on a, an early peer reviewer, one of the good ones, actually, we even used uh, the uh, Robbins I and E, you know, for intervention and exposure to try to understand the, uh, the different biases due to confounding, selection of participants, etc. you name it, and you see how we judged it. And of course, one could argue that for, for perhaps you might judge that some of these dots are yellow here. We were overly optimistic at the time. I'm not sure whether I still would judge everything like that, but at least we tried to get everything as proper as possible also for what's going on here. Here important is that we believe the any public health interventions, whether there was at least one switched on at the time point of the exposure or not, more reliable and the number of public health interventions than those here be why we felt there was so much of a correlation between those and we didn't have enough that had implemented that we did not want to run this was pre-specified again that we did not want to run um, multivariable models that had all of them included because we, we would end up in weird collinearity problems so we did not do that therefore we downgraded these three we would, not, we would not be able to, uh, you know, look into the independent effects. But we were confident that we could look at counts, more, uh, zero, one, or more than one, and that we could look at the composite of any public health intervention as a covariate. That's the results univariate first, no? So you start here on top, nothing with latitudes, nothing with temperature, but relative and absolute humidity, that, that could be a signal, no? Then here, another cluster, which is important. So these are the two variables, actually the three that we felt were associated with the capacity to test, no? So what you see here makes perfect sense. The, the, there seems to be a steeper slope if you have more um, health expenditures uh, or more GDP invested in health expenditures. And there is, you know, something like, uh, not even a statistical trend, but also something that just indicates, okay, GDP, the more GDP do you have, the, 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 the steeper the slope. So there is definitely, if you look at it in a univariate model, there is definitely something going on. It would be highly desirable to have the testing data, but we didn't, it was impossible to get them at the time. And the same with the infectious disease vulnerability index, um, uh, it, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's basically just, uh, just indicating the more vulnerable you are, the less epidemic growth, and that's probably just a detection problem. <clears throat> then here there are the public health interventions, and the point with the composite and with the numbers here, you know, with the test for trend is strong, 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 considerably, considerably stronger than what you will see for relative or absolute humidity. And at the end, the geographical regions, Asia is the reference here. This, uh, we only, would only see that in the legends. So what you would, will see here is that the pandemic moves 
And depending on where you are, the signals look different. This will be important. We will see that here in this slide. So the pandemic moves obviously from east to west. But that's not the only move. If you look at where it started, basically, it also moves from near the equator to further from the equator. And most likely the original data that I've shown you where you saw these, all these beautiful, also with the outliers, these beautiful relationships that we had, this is most likely confounded by the move of the pandemic from east to west, from the equator to away from the equator. Here is um, a scatter plot with a box and whisker plot associated with it for the count of public health interventions, irrespective of that, that's still a univariate, the count of public health interventions um, and uh, the rate ratios. Also look at that, you know, so the highest rate ratios you have now at 16, meaning a 16 fold increase during the week, during the follow-up week in cumulative cases, but most of them are much more realistic. Remember what I originally showed you, there were rate ratios of 128. That's just, this was just a pipe dream. Luckily, we didn't publish it. Here is the, uh, the flat line for latitude. You know, that's a quadratic relationship. The, uh, the regression model doesn't know what to do anymore. It gets a bit wobbly here. That's the rate ratio, uh, that's the, uh, the, uh, the scatter plot or the, 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 the bubble plot for, uh, for temperature. It's a flat line, more or less. That's relative humidity. It has a, a certain depth in there, as you see. And that's absolute humidity. There's a, a certain slope, but not that much. Remember what I said just before, the thing is probably confounded by, you know, this move from east to west. So what you basically need to Actually, do... Just before you go on, there, Pierce, small question again from the troublemaker Rettelmeyer. Uh, do these, did these graphs of, uh, of latitude and humidity, et cetera, break your heart? No, I was, to be honest with you, I was surprised that everything just had evaporated. Why? And, and it's not quite true. You know what broke my heart? What broke my heart is, and this also what affected me in the first place when I actually lost it, when I saw the first graph, you know, on the, on the 8th of March in the afternoon, Ellen and my wife can, uh, can witness to that, I actually started to cry because if this had been true, this would have meant that low-income countries would have had a bit better cards than they have now. If it had been true, many of the low-income countries would have struggled a bit less. And that touched me at the time. And I would have wished there would have been a relationship, to be honest, but it was now so clear. And what broke my heart is that I then knew we have a real problem, you know, with all these poor sots in all these countries who are less privileged than we are. That's what broke my heart. Okay, that's a good response. Heartful. So, you know, what you need to do in all of this, in any case, you need to incorporate the major geographical regions as a covariate. Otherwise, this is terribly confounded. So that's what we did. We pre-specified that we forced this into the model. And you already see in this parsimonious, that's again pre-specified parsimonious multivariable model for absolute humidity that made it into the model just in here. The signal is not that strong anymore as before in the univariate situation. Remember this thing just jumps from continent to continent. And if you just have you know, if you account for the starting point being different and the stage of the pandemic being different, things don't look that exciting anymore. But even though the signal decreased on this slope of the, of the uh, cumulative frequency curve, it's not the original, the bell-shaped curve, it's the slope. Huh? So uh, the signal will be stronger if you do it on the, on the bell-shaped curve, basically. The signal still stays with a strong p-value for trend for the number of public health interventions. And we pre-specified to include that in the model. Here is the multivariable. Okay, Peter, just before you go on, there's a question now raised by Amanda Squires. Uh, I'll go ahead and hand on mute, Amanda. Still can't hear you, Amanda. Shall we go on or um, 
or I mean, I'll read the question maybe um, for, uh, what do you think about the association of the Ukrainian crash in Iran and possible foreign workers traveling in, and family members from China to Iran and worldwide as people travel to Iran at this time? Okay, so it's about the s specific mobility patterns in one country. Yes, you see, I think there were a lot of idiosyncrasies that are heartbreaking with hindsight. You know, it can be, you know, the, 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 the woman, the women on straight on March the 8th. It can be what you were just describing. It can be Liverpool against Atletico Madrid in the UK that may have contributed so considerably to what then went on in the UK. When you imagine how little it would have taken to save literally tens of thousands of lives, it's heartbreaking. That is truly heartbreaking. And it's very little that could make a really, really, really big difference at that time point, you know, did we understand it? Probably not, but it's remarkable. All of those can play a role. I don't know exactly anymore when this was, you know, with the, uh, with, with the airplane, et cetera, et cetera. But, but it could well be, you know, all of this. Remember the Spanish flu, the pandemic there, you know, we're already anyway in, in, in a time that has so much mobility. And then if something happens like that, this thing was bound to play a role. We just pay the price as the Spanish flu, you know, just was related to everybody just going through one single camp in the northern of France and going home after World War I. You know, distributing it just merrily. And we distributed it merrily too, unfortunately. Yes. We'll let you go on. This is the, uh, the just for completeness sake, then an automated stepwise backward selection. The point is you see very similar results. What is interesting here is that the absolute humidity has a slightly stronger signal, but the most important part is again, is this here, the, uh, this dose response relationship with a number of public health interventions. You know? Remember what I said, you need to force uh, major geographical regions into the model and look at what happens with absolute humidity if you force into the model all areas, then only you know, restricted to high income countries, etc. to address more, a bit more confounding. You see the signal actually is not that clear with absolute humidity and also with relative humidity. It's just not a clear signal. You find all of that in the appendix of the paper if you want to go there. Whereas if you do the same story for number of public health interventions, the signal is here to stay. That's important. So what are the conclusions here? Well, just what I had before, very prosaic, no? So even though we had this first signal and luckily I went for a walk with Emily and didn't contribute to the garbage out there, um, epidemic growth is not associated, not associated with geographic latitude or temperature. Since, you know, absolute and relative humidity per se are not highly correlated and we see some signal for both of them, it is a bit suggestive. So we will look into that more. Huh? So I have an approach and we're working on it right now that there is a minor role, but this role will always be minor relative to other aspects. It remains hypothetical. The public health interventions, no discussion. It works, you know. And this was a time when, you know, they, it was uh, being said, look at Sweden, it works beautifully, etc., etc. Bullshit. Um, it, it is, but it had to be said here, you know. It's, it's clear it works out, but of course it comes at a price. And we need to be very careful and need to understand much more what are the individual contributions of different public health interventions, for instance, you know, mass gatherings, school closures, closures of uh, non essential businesses, etc. We need to learn how this goes. If there's somebody who still doesn't believe me that these data probably tell you something which is real and not just some sort of weird artifact of, a, you know, some, some crazy epidemiologist or so, it's a great, it's, it's a great website, actually, if you want to go there. That's, I think that's the best uh, projections you find. And you also always see the raw data. That's Sweden. Uh, just right now, I downloaded it this morning, uh, the graph. Look at the, the scale here, you know, just the daily cases. I'm not sure now what's actually going on now here and what happened here, whether this was something lost or a change of diagnostic criteria, remember, or 
not remember, but I'm telling you that Sweden is massively under testing anyway compared with uh, with other countries. Compare it with Sweden has 10 million inhabitants, Denmark only has five, but De Denmark is neighboring. Compare it with the number of cases in Denmark and the shape of the curve. That's Sweden. That's Denmark. So, you know, the max there at 350 cases here, the max here at more than 2,000. And even, you know, here just at, at that time, still growing here are at 1,000 cases or so. Here is the cumulative number of cases. So we would have analyzed this slope. Remember that in our, in our study, the cumulative number of cases with, with Sweden, probably a tenfold underestimate, at least a tenfold underestimate estimate of cases for Sweden. That's the cumulative number of cases for Denmark who tests appropriately. So these numbers are not even directly comparable. What is probably directly comparable is the number of deaths, sort of. They, pro they might misdiagnose more in Sweden than in Denmark. I can't prove that, but we know there are misdiagnosed uh, cases. We see that on our own intensive care unit, for instance, that, uh, that you miss cases that were actually positive. So that's the number of deaths in Sweden versus the number of deaths in Denmark. No. So if you have had any doubts, it's not that Sweden didn't do anything. Sweden did quite a bit. People, the, uh, a large part of the population was reasonable, but they didn't do, you know, some of the major, uh, the major aspects like closing schools. They never closed schools and stuff like that might have backfired. You know? So here we are in the north of a country that has a major struggle still, which is again heartbreaking also for other reasons. And um, we just need to continue to do the good work. We were also lucky in this province, lucky us. But uh, we need to be careful because summer will not, co not come to our help. It will to a certain extent, why? Because we all are outside and the probability, you know, especially if there's an aerosol transmission going on to, uh, to, get, to get the transmission outside compared with a closed space is obviously very, very small if you're outside. So let's just all go outside and enjoy the weather and everything else and the risk will be low. But, uh, you know, things could look different if we go inside and start to party inside in nice clubs, et cetera, et cetera. That was it. Thanks a lot. What a genial way to end. We've got time for maybe two or, or, or three other questions before ending early. Let me ask you the first question. Of all the public health interventions out there, because they're, you know, they really are burdensome, what do you think is the single most powerful one? Or do you think that they're all merely a surrogate for just improved hand hygiene and sneezing into your elbow and staying home when you're sick? Um, I do not believe that they're merely a surrogate, but we need to work on disentangling those different ones. So we go much further now. So uh, Paul was asking, for instance, now regarding testing data. So the last few weeks we spent with getting testing data for our 144 regions over time that we're able or at least approximate approximating then that we're actually able to look into positive rates, absolute uh, number of tests per 1 million population, etc., during the exposure and during the follow-up period to basically continue to model that more properly and then go to the uh, slope of the epidemic curve, the bell-shaped curve directly, and then, uh, you know, just be able also to, uh, to incorporate the, uh, the testing strategy as a covariate. And then we'll see what happens. And then we try to understand the relative contribution to um, epidemic growth, but also to the slope for a number of deaths of these different interventions. And then you can go on. So we will continue to work on that quite considerably. And, uh, and they try to disentangle all of that. I do not believe it's just a surrogate for hand washing that's next to impossible when you look at what goes on. It's so obvious now also with the lockdowns. The big question is, were the lockdowns really necessary or not? Could we have done it with a bit less? It's not that Sweden was completely dysfunctional, no? So they did something right. They had for a long time, they kept their R0 at one, more or less. So the the, the um, volunteer um, aspect of it that people, just most people started to be reasonably okay, perhaps combined with school closures and avoiding mass gatherings above 50, 
would it have resulted in enough and we wouldn't have you know uh, needed to do a full lockdown or so whether formal lockdown or just you know uh, mandated or just uh, advised and all the other measures are in place who knows we need to find that out it was certainly the right thing to do but since we're talking about second waves flare ups etc cetera, etc cetera, we need to get we need to get this as good as it gets and we work on it heavily in the background and there's more to come at least for, from our group and certainly also from other groups all right our next question is from Surya. Um, who is really going to pin you down on the second wave. I I'll go ahead, Surya. Hi, thank you for the great presentation. Um, my question is that, um, um, do you think that uh, when fall comes and we all go back inside our homes to escape the cold, of course, um, the number of cases will increase in Canada compared to what we are seeing right now? I'm not a prophet. But, um, you know, by everything I know, first of all, all, already now, you know, if we won't be careful, especially if we're not careful with, uh, with uh, traveling from the US, especially, but also from places, just from hotspots like Sweden, etc. And things are being carried in again. And we haven't survived everything. We have hotspots in Toronto. Then, especially if inside, then things will be a problem you know the problem with this virus is it doesn't need much of favorable conditions it does not that distinguishes it from the flu we all are partially immune against the flu or most of us no also because of vaccination strategies but also because we got it over time but here we start from scratch and even in sweden in stockholm right now and they have a high burden remember they have a high burden they only found about 7% of people in Stockholm with a relatively high urban density. Only 7% of people, you know, being positive. Remember New York, remember the disaster in New York, perhaps 17% being positive. This was war zone, no? So we need to be extremely careful. And the more we go inside, the more careful we need to be especially, you know, if we just have a lot of people in a room. It makes me nervous, even in my home country. They have it completely under control now in Switzerland. They have it completely under control. But, you know, mass scattering cutoffs at 300 now, also inside, it could lead to super spreading events. And we would not like to go there. All right. It's sort of a bit of a, uh, a, I mean, a sad note to finish on, but... I don't see any other questions, so we will end here. Thanks very much, uh, Peter, and we'll see everybody next week again. Thanks a lot.